calling all green fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands on practical advice, and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, the Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za. Gardening with Tanya is proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Mayfit. Grow your own bee-friendly flowers. EcoBuzz. Where nature leads the way. Environmentally friendly solutions for your gardens. And TanyaFisser.com. For all your gardening goodies and supplies. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, and I know we missed the last Thursday, but... Sure, we couldn't do anything about that. We had a bit of a COVID situation going on, you know. Yeah, we had one of those. Um, so, but good news is everybody's fine, everybody's safe. Um, uh, those of the crew that, that had it, um, Mason's back on camera. Uh, wave to Mason, everybody. It's good to have you back, my boy. It's good to have you back. Um, and um, guys, just, yeah, it's, it's you, you know, I don't need to tell you. Um, it's, it's really, there's only one word to say, it's vus. It's bus out there. So um, please be incredibly safe, um, really incredibly safe. I mean, at, at, I don't care if you get allergic reactions with the sanitizer or whatever, but you've got to bathe yourself in this stuff um, and you've got to be really vigilant. Um, keep you and your family and your loved ones very, very safe. And although there's temptation, do you know, Saturday evening, sitting there Saturday afternoon, oh, let's invite our mates over. Let's have a top and dop. Um, guys, you don't know. You just don't know. And it goes against everything we believe in and everything as human social creatures because that's what we are. It's like I miss talking to you guys. I miss actually seeing you in front of me, you know, being able to see your faces and your smiles and your laughs. Um, I, I miss that. Now look into a camera and, yeah, there's, there's major downsides to that because when you make a joke, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you make a joke, <laughs> you got to laugh at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> which I tend to do quite well because I'm a bit mental, but I, I really miss you guys. Um, and uh, hopefully soon, hopefully soon this too shall pass, as they say in the classics. Um, but today, today we're talking pollinator gardens. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, Paul Funk, from, oh, this is a message to you, Mace. Um, from Paul Funk, good to hear, Mason. <laughs> I love that, I love that. Um, guys, uh, yeah, I'm very emotional today. It's a... Uh, it's, it's one of those days. Um, we've had uh, a lot going on um, in, in Lone Hill um, and in the Raw team. And it, it really, it gets, it gets very scary. Um, it, it really does. And, and for that, we, we all just want to make sure that we're safe. And, 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 it, and it's hard. Um, it really is hard. Um, today's also the anniversary of my, my middle brother, Pierre. Um, he passed away 24 years ago today, and uh, yeah, those things just come flooding back, and they catch you at the really wrong time, like now. But um, but anyway, um, and he was a great gardener, guys. He 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 should have been the gardener. Um, he really should have, because he was a way better gardener than me. Um, and uh, but today today I dedicate this to to him. Um, right, let the show go on. Uh, now I can't even see because I'm crying so much, um, <laughs> but as it goes. Guys, I hope you got your coffee um, and you're ready for a beautiful segment on pollinator gardens uh, because there is so much more to gardening than just making pretty, you know. Um, I picked up a magazine, um, now I'm all steamed up. <laughs> I think I need a tissue, Megs. Um, 
I, I picked up a, a magazine the other day um, from the UK and it was really interesting. In fact, it, it, it was really so interesting, thank you so much, that I, I, it, it jolted me. Um, and I went back and I thought, is, is, what, what am I seeing here? And I went back to the last three issues. Yes, they do get to us only about a year later, but never mind, we still do get them, <laughs> thanks to the Um uh, But And the whole magazine was dedicated to wildlife, uh, wildlife and pollinators in the garden. Um, and I went back, and, and most of that issue as well was all about that. And, and we, we hear these, and if you watch Nat Geo Wild, which is one of my favorite channels, um, you see time and time and time again their programs on what if the bees disappeared? Um, what if the lace wings disappeared? What if the birds went away? And our farmers that are hard at work, hard at work all over South Africa are reliant on that little guy, that little bee, to ensure that their crops are a success. Think about it. Just think about the magnitude of that. That everything, everything based is based and depends on that little bee. Because if he doesn't arrive, boys and girls, there ain't a show. The party ain't happen. Um, and that too is so important in our gardens. And the more maybe mature I become in gardening, you want to see how mature I am? May show them. Show them, look at that. And that ain't no highlights, eh? Somebody told me the other day, oh, your hair's looking wonderful, Tanya. I love the color. I'm like, yeah, that's called that to roll. That to roll. I'm over the highlights. I'm over that, guys. <laughs> um, but as, as I think my gardening style changes, and, and I know yours does as well, um, so I'm becoming so much more acutely aware um, of, of bringing that beautiful wildlife into the garden and making space for it. Um, and making sure that there is a space for it in my garden. Um, but before we get into it, let's see who's online um, and let's say good morning. Right, um, Kerry's online. Um, oh, thank you. Fran, good morning. Um, Lavelle um, would have been my brother's 60th birthday. He passed 11 years ago. He always used to pick the flowers for me. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. Let's not go, not go there. Excuse the sniffs, guys. Um, Kerry, good morning. Uh, Renisha, Megan, good morning from Durban North. David um, from Mulberry Park in Alberton. Guys, you guys must be freezing up there. I, I hear it's really cold up in Josie. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see who else is here. Who else, who else, who else? Um, someone from Langebaan. Um, Suzanne from George. Good morning, Georg. Georg. Bernice from Port Edward, Shuno, good morning, um, Melissa from Joburg, and guys, where's from the Cape? Oh, Adrian from Cape Town. Hey, guys, the next cold front is coming to smack the Western Cape. So make sure you've got all your winter woolies out, which I'm sure you have already, but it's going to get cold. Um, we were looking at the weather report for next week, um, and folks, here in Asagar, um, it's going to be two degrees one morning next week. Two degrees. I mean, can you tree it? Really? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a lovely cold winter. And for that, I am grateful. Because when we have cold winters, what I do know is that those fungal diseases that are hanging around, like especially up there in the Rose Garden, I know that they are going to get nuked. Gah, nuked like Hiroshima. They are going to go. All right, um, and what I do also know is that the spring that we're all waiting for um, is on its way. Um, we've also gone past the winter solstice. Hallelujah, amen. Uh, I, I tell you, we wait for that day. We wait for that day so that I know that the sun every day is going to peak up just a few minutes earlier. And it's going to go down just a few minutes later, which means my day is extended and my gardening day is longer which is so important because um, I kind of get like you get a bit iffy in winter. I don't know about you, but like there's a latent like uh, almost a depression. Um, I mean, and we hardly have winter here, but but I really don't like it, um, which is why I had to install a light in my succulent house so that I could still garden when the sun went down um, because it's like where the hour's gone, guys. 
Um, but anyway, right, here we go. Oh. Last sip of coffee. Um, who else is here? Um, Michelle is here. Samantha's from Port Elizabeth. Lee Edwards from a chilly Cape Town. Oh, yes. Um, Janet says it's sunny, warm Joburg. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. Um, uh, Kerry's here. Um, well, at least we get the cold from our gardens. Yes. Suzanne from the Bluff. P Penelope. Um, Southport is 14 degrees. Tanya Pearson um, from Vintuk, Namibia. Uh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, guys, let's get into it. Well, and Rola is being insistent on running around like a naughty child, as he always does. Bring that naughty child here, and uh, let's show everybody. He had a, he had a new haircut. Um, Rola had a new haircut. Um, come, my boy. Come, come say hello to everybody. Come. Um, Rola had a haircut the other week. Um, my mother and I um, had, a, had, a, had a slight argument about his haircut, but you know what's interesting is that as soon as he's had his haircut and then he runs into the kitchen to go and say hello, it's like, oh, you look so gorgeous. Your haircut is so beautiful. You're such a cute boy. Boy, say morning, everybody. Say morning. There we go. There we go, my big boy. He's being very camera shy now. Guys, when we talk pollinator gardens, oh, hello, Bahari. What's really important is that we create the succession in, in planting. And when we talk about that succession, what we're talking about is having a haven, having something that's either coming into flower or in flower or going over. We want to make sure that there are always some, that there is always some form of seed, okay? Some form of seed for the birds to be able to enjoy. Some form of nectar. All right, so plants with lovely long flowers, and I'm going to point those out to you and show them. And then, of course, those for the bees, which is simply just beautiful pollen, which is what we want. Um, and what we're going to do today is give you a quick breakdown on some of the plants that you can use. Um, and it's important as well that the most essential part of all of this is to have a good source of water. And I'm always amazed. Um, uh, and, and sometimes, and I've seen this, is that when you've got a bird bath, guys, don't put the bird bath in the middle of the garden in a low garden bed. I mean, birds are, do you want to go down, my boy? Or do you want to sit here? Bird, birds are like skittish, eh? They're like skittish. They wear, they're worrying where like Tom the cat is, you know? So please always do have your bird bath close to a tree or a shrub where the birds can then come down, like they settle in halfway. They check out the scene. Okay. Hey, mate, it's fine. We can go. That hateful cat, he's gone. All right? And then they can cruise down to the bird bath. Don't put out a bird bath in the middle of nowhere where the birds literally have to come in like a Boeing and like, coming in hot, baby, coming in hot. Um, they're not going to be there. They're going to be too scared. So the first thing that we're needing to do is make sure that we have got birds. We've got a bird bath in the right spot because when we get the birds, okay, a whole lot of other things start happening. A whole lot of other things. So let's talk about that first, about what plants we can use that are so critical and that you're guaranteed, 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 I'll tell you guaranteed, to make sure that you've got lots of lovely birds in the garden. Now, um, winter, they're looking for things. They are, they, 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 they're hungry. Um, food source is low. So what kind of plants should we have in our garden? And I'm going to give you one or two examples of plants that are just no-brainers, guys. And um, I'm going to show you one or two out in the garden as well. But let's start off with this over here. This is this over here. Folks, you, you've got to have this plant in your garden. Um, this is Salvia lucantha. Um, it has this lovely grey foliage. I'll pull one of these out of here. Um, and... It's got most insane grey foliage. We picked this out the garden. Um, and and grey is so important um, in the garden. So you get different types. You get this over here that just has, it's all purple, all right? And you get one with the little white um, that pushes through. You're eating it. Um, and you get one that's got pink in it as well. But tough as absolute nails. Tough as nails. You can't kill this thing. And the other thing is, is that it's like a one-drop plant. 
What do we mean by a one drop plant? That means it requires so little water. In fact, we never water ours in the garden. We don't. Um, they grow, they flower, the birds love them, the butterflies dance all over them. Okay, say bye bye, Rolo. Say bye, everybody. Cheers. High five. Okay. All right. Um, they, they just absolutely love it. So this is a plant that is like a serious no-brainer in any garden. Um, when you buy them in the nursery bags, they never look amazing. It, it's just a thing about salvias. They never look fantastic. They look a bit scraggly, but get it into the garden and don't be afraid to prune this thing. Don't be afraid. I mean, when you get your secateurs, when this guy starts to get a bit like lanky and hanging over a bit, you go in there and you prune it way down. You prune it exceptionally hard because it will come back again. All that we do once we've pruned it, we give it a good thick layer of mulch, a handful or two of Atlantic Bio Ocean, and Bob's your uncle. Okay, another plant that is an absolute no-brainer is this one over here. Now, I want to come around and show you this here. This is an amazing plant. This is also a salvia. Um, this is called Salvia Africana Lutea. It's indigenous. But look, look at these bracts. Aren't they insane? The brown is just too beautiful. And let me tell you, if you pick this, and put it in a vase, man, is it spectacular. A large shrub, it's gonna to get to two meters easily, two meters in your garden, flowers now throughout the winter into spring. When it's finished flowering, give it a good haircut and away it comes again. But I've seen this plant growing like on the dunes in Port Elizabeth. I've seen it growing in Gauteng. I've seen it growing in Brits where it gets really, really cold and it does exceptionally well really exceptionally well so so please keep an eye out for that plant because if you're wanting to attract beautiful birds and especially those that are looking for the nectar then this is a sure winner an absolute winner okay guys i gotta blow my nose this is gonna get scary <laughs> <laughs> all righty um next up if we're talking butterflies, and now, so now we think about it, you've got shrubs which are kind of forming your backdrop of your garden. They're going to be giving you some structure. Um, then when we start going into lower plants, and before we get into that, um, I really want to talk to you about this plant. Um, this man, man, if I wish I could transport the sweet, sweet scent straight through to you. Um, this is called Buddleia. This is Buddleia auriculata. And this is a butterfly magnet. This is like a babe magnet for butterflies, guys. Um, Budlia indigenous, large shrub, two meters. Um, but it also does attract pollinators. So when we're talking pollinators, we're also talking the bees. I mean, we're talking bees, we're talking butterflies, and we're talking birds. But they devour this plant. Um, truly spectacular. It can get a bit scraggly, okay, I'm with you. Yes, it can get a bit, it looks a bit untidy, but the secret is hard pruning. Guys, get in there, prune it hard, have an argument with someone, and then go out there and take it out, because you're not gonna kill it. I promise you, you're not gonna kill it. Uh, Budley auriculata, um, butterfly bush, also known as spectacular, just spectacular. Okay, now, Let's talk about the birds that need the seed. Ah, okay. Birds that need the seed. And, you know, the grasses we, we, we know have become so in fashion. A lot of people are planting them in their gardens um, because they just give us that other dimension. What do they give us? Well, not only do they look great in the garden because they've got that tall, whimsical look about them, um, but one thing that I have noticed that people do is they prune them directly in the middle of winter. Please don't prune them in the middle of winter because in the middle of winter is when they've got these beautiful plumes. Okay, they've got this over here is the Penicetum rubrum, um, which is the non-invasive Penicetum. Remember the green one, the one with green leaves is the invasive. This one over here with the maroon leaves is not. Okay, it's not the one. And it is spectacular. And I'm gonna show you some in the garden a little bit later. But now this plant, the seeds, Oh, the, you know, the, 
they hang. I mean, there's, sometimes there's so many birds on here trying to attack the seed that the poor plumes are like right down here. And this is another little indigenous grass. Um, and look at all those lovely seeds that the birds are just going to devour because it's that. So we're supplying food. We want a smorgasbord throughout the year of the different layers and levels, okay? Which is why we want to make sure that we've got things that are coming into flower, that are going out of flower. And if you've got seed pods, please just leave them. Let them be. Let them absolutely be. Okay, let's go to another grass over here. A wonderful indigenous grass. This is called Anthericum starlight. Um, gets little black seeds uh, that you often find, because it's a low grass, um, you'll find the little thrashes in that go along and you hear them scratching. You hear them scratching inside the, 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 the under, uh, just under the, the, the foliage. And then all of a sudden you'll see, oh, there we go. They've picked one of these little seeds up or they've grabbed something and off they go. Um, beautiful little plant, lovely flowers. So, sun or semi-shade, um, there you go. Okay, now that we've gone on the grasses, we're going to show you a few other ones a little bit later. But let's go into some perennials. Because perennials is really where the show begins. And that is where we then are providing beautiful, beautiful pollen, uh, beautiful pollen and plants that are for those specifically. So what are we talking about? We're talking about bees. We're talking about lacewings. We're talking about ladybirds. We're talking about dragonflies, um, uh, butterflies. That, that's what we're talking about. And to have those in your garden is a true, true blessing. So what do we plant to get that look and feel? Um, take a look here. And this is where I want to touch on something that's a little bit odd, a little bit odd, but I want you to, to work with me um, because it, it, it's an absolute joy. Um, to see it in the garden. Now this over here, you might be saying, Whoa, what is this beautiful yellow flower, Tanya? It's so pretty. It's so, so pretty. Well, guys, <laughs> some of you will recognize this. <laughs> yes, you would. If I break this off, you'll recognize that leaf. Yes, you will. You recognize that leaf. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, you know that. It comes in your, in your packs if you still buy those salad packs from that shop, okay? Um, you buy it to put into your stir fries. Yeah, you got it. That is bok choy. That's the Chinese green. But what we do in the garden, and this we picked just out of the veggie garden this morning, is that we harvest some. So we harvest it, you know, when it's short and small and still looks like that one that you buy in the shop. It still looks like that one, yeah. We cut it, we throw it into stir fries, we wilt it down. But what we also do is we leave at least two or three to bolt. Yes, let it bolt, okay? You can see these were its leaves. It's now sending up this beautiful flower spark. I mean, how pretty is that? And isn't it just gorgeous? This morning when we picked these, there were three or four bees on one of these. It was just like, getting in there, I'm getting in there. Don't, I, get out my way, get out my way, George. Um, it was an absolute, complete circus in here on these because they love it. These flowers are also edible. So 100%, you can eat them as well. Now imagine in your flower bed, in your perennial borders, if you planted a few of these, yeah, plant a few of them and let them go. Leave them, let them bolt. Um, last summer, we sowed some carrots in my brother's rose garden. Well, let me tell you now, my hired help, my gardener Marco, thought that I had gone kukululu. He was like, carrots are for the vegetable garden. I'm like, dude, work with me, work with me. I'm gonna show you. And lo and behold, what happens when you've left a carrot and it grows and it flower and it, and it bolts and then it flowers, ha! The most amazing, meter high, large, flat hands of white flowers, like Queen Anne's lace. Spectacular. So, veggies need to be in the flower beds, not only in the veggie garden. 
another thing that happens, and this, this is one, Mason, you're going to have to come in quite tight here. This is one of the bok choys that we have, that has now gone to seed. Okay, so not only then have I gone through that, I've provided beautiful pollen for the bees, but here we're getting seed now. Okay, so the seed is not quite ripe, but look at all the seed, guys. Because what happens then is that we just make sure that around these plants, that this soil is, is nice and soft and friable because when these little seeds drop, ha, huh, what happens? The next generation emerges, just like that. But more importantly, look what's on the top. Full of aphids, yummy, fat, healthy, gorgeous aphids. Now, Tanya, why am I leaving the aphids? Well, I'm leaving the aphids there because I want to make sure that every single hierarchy from the, the birds, the bees, all the other little hohos have got something to eat and the ladybirds because they come along here then and munch at them and devour them. And there's the next cycle. Okay, so, so don't be scared. And generally you find, guys, that the brassicas, so we're talking about brassicas, it's anything leafy and cabbage-like looking. So that be it your broccoli, your cabbage, your pak choy, your tzatzoy, um, Brussels sprouts, God help you if you have to plant them. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm not into those. <laughs> I'm so not into those. Uh, but anyway, um, and I've never been successful at growing them, so they're out the window, out the window, yeah, drop kick. <sighs> Um, but the aphids will stay on these. They're not going to go to your entire garden and like, ah, aphids all over. No, they will go to these soft, succulent, leafy plants because it's easier for them to get their little proboscis in there and suck out the juices. Whilst, whilst they're busy having fun at the party, something comes along and eats them, and that completes the cycle. Now, I'm sure you're busy, you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, well, Tanya, what happens if, if like, if I get like, like red spider on this? What if I get red spider on my cabbages? Um, and then how do I get rid of them? And I can't spray a chemical because, because then like, the birds can't go in there. Um, and, and what if I get um, a caterpillar infestation? And then like they're eating something that's really important to me. Um, be it my cabbage that I've been waiting for. And if it's a red cabbage, you've been waiting a long time that comes along and wants to devour them all. So this is what you need to use, guys, here, because this is where it all begins and ends. The EcoBuzz range of, of um, products that can be used, which are ladybird friendly. It's a bacteria which is friendly it's found in the soil it was extracted and created to form this product pet friendly bee friendly and human friendly i mean you can eat this stuff so this over here is for um caterpillars so for any larvas that you've got you spray it on the larva um and what it does it it stops the, the caterpillars from eating that's all it literally does is it stops the caterpillar from eating the caterpillar then dies anorexic um, but the good news is that if a bird comes along and eats the caterpillar, nothing happens. Absolutely nothing happens. This over here is Disease Pro. This is also, this is unbelievable. So this is a biofungicide and this eats powdery mildew and downy mildew. So you spray this on, especially for roses, guys. We use this on roses. We use this on cucumbers and on um, gem squash, all of those family that generally are very susceptible to getting powdery mildew. In fact, we sprayed some on our echinacea in the garden just two weeks ago because we had powdery mildew there. But the echinacea are also great attractors for the butterflies and the bees come along there. So I don't want to spray something that's going to harm them. This is a biological friendly product. So I can spray it, I can eat it, I can do anything and it's not going to harm all the other things along. This over here, Pest Pro deals with white flower, deals with red spider. Ah, yes, red spider, because we know that thing is really tough and difficult to get rid of. But once again, this biological approach, all you do is it comes in three little sachets in each box. It's really simple, guys. Very, very easy. Um, 
let me open it up here for you to have a look at um, and if you want to know where to get these guys you can get them on my online store and um, just go to tanyafissa.com and you can purchase them there so it's one little sachet we've made it so simple it's one sachet into one liter of water or alternatively five liters depending on which product it is mix it up into a good spray bottle and spray it on it's easy it's as simple as that um, and and for us in our garden this works for us, um, it, it really does. And I know that even if little Rolo had to take this whole thing and eat it, eat this whole thing, nothing would happen, absolutely nothing. And I also know that I'm not destroying everything around it. If it falls on, onto the ground and if it seeps into the soil, I know the earthworms are fine. Yeah, they are. Um, and I know that even if I touch it, Nothing's going to happen to me. So, yeah, guys, this is what we call about being responsible in terms of what you are spraying on your garden and how you do it. Right. Okay. Now, let's get these beauties. But actually, I want to walk out with this into the garden. But we'll do that just now. Um, another few plants that I want to just touch on in terms of what you can use. Um, beautiful lavenders. Now, I know a lot of you guys have, have dramas with lavenders. And you're like... They just won't grow. They, they, I kill them. I kill them. So the secret with lavenders is not too much water, guys. Please. There, there are two varieties which I strongly recommend. If you've been bad at them, then get these because these are no nonsense. And I really doubt you'll kill them. So this is a, a different lavender. Have a look at it here. Um, it's got flat leaves. Flat, flat leaves. Very different. Greeny, not gray. More green. And it sends up these tall spikes with the little flowers on top. Um, and this lavender is called, now please, the common names are very, don't, don't use the common names. Please just don't use them. Some people call them the Spanish lavender. Some call it the Australian lavender. Some call it the fern lavender from its fern-like foliage. Um, and that's one that you can definitely use. Do not overwater it. Maximum once a week. Once you've planted it, okay, say you just planted today, then I would recommend a watering twice a week, okay, and then you can start backing off on the water. And once a week watering is more than enough. Then, of course, there's this one down here, which I want to take you to, which is another great lavender, which is this one, Margaret Roberts. I mean, guys, this is insane. Margaret Roberts has got the beautiful grey foliage. Um, um, amazing amazing scent and for this butterflies love it just just love it and what I love about these lavenders which is why I prefer them to the stukas which is shorter is that they hold their flower proud really nice and proud up above the foliage so you get that transition and um, you get that beautiful blue uh, which is spectacular absolutely spectacular right now another plant that does exceptionally well, exceptionally well, um, for attracting pollinators to the garden is borage. Guys, um, and it's coming time to start looking for the seeds um, or start looking for a plant as soon as we get to the end of winter um, to put into your garden. Um, I'm gonna get ready to get out into the garden and whilst you're watching this, I'm gonna get out there, so enjoy the clip that's coming up. There are so many plants in the plant world that I simply love and I find it really difficult to be able to control myself to say what I should and shouldn't be planting in my garden simply because I need space. But you know what? There's always more room for one more. <laughs> Folks, literally, this used to be one plant and when you buy a borage plant from your local garden centre, it will be probably in a little pot to have two or three leaves. That's all it looks like. It never has flowers on it. The plant life cycle of a borage is about three to four months. When it dies, it spread all these seeds in this garden bed and then just started its life cycle again. Amazingly, borage as a herb, the bees just love it. It's one of their most, most delicious, favoritest, ultimatest, <laughs> awesome flowers. You can see already around me here, the bees are going bananas. They're loving it, they're getting all the pollen in their faces. Having this plant here encourages and helps the sustainability of a whole lot of other plants in my garden. So, borage grows up, gets to about a meter in height, will flower, but just look at the blue. 
guys, look at the blue in that flower. That blue is so unique. And the way the light catches, the little hairs on it, ah, is amazing. The other important thing is that because the leaves are quite hairy, you know, have a look here. You can actually feel the hairs. Because they're quite hairy, it tells me a few things. Number one, that this plant is incredibly drought resistant. It's also wind resistant because the hairs reflect the sun rays and also the hairs help to buffer the wind as it's hitting it. Besides the beautiful flowers, what I do love borage for is the fact that when it dies down and I've shaken the seeds out, I can take this plant and throw it on my compost heap because borage is one of the world's natural compost activators. Just amazing. So you put it on and it activates your compost and makes more compost quicker. So get it out there guys and plant it. It is incredible. Please don't go into a garden centre looking for a plant like this with flowers like that. You're not going to get it. Oh, and before we go, another great thing to use the flowers for, break them, pop them into salads, completely edible, all right? Great in ice cubes, summer drinks, gin and tonics, you know what I mean, go out and get it. There you have it guys, borage, borage, borage. And the reason why it works so well for composting is because when you put all those big green leaves in there, it like gives it a nitrogen boost. You know like you see those fast cars with nitrous, as they go fast, this is like giving nitrogen bang into the compost heap and it really just gives it a good kick start. So here I've got my, my bok choy, this is my flower that I had a bit earlier and I want to show you the beauty of this. Take a look down here. Oh, Man, and it's, it's a hive of activity. It's an absolute hive of activity. The bees are going cuckoo in this plant. Um, <clears throat> and here we have beautiful salvia. Now, bee, will you just sit still so Mason can get it? Uh, this is status, um, beautiful status parisia. And guys, this plant is such a winner. Um, it's a water zone one. Um, follow me, Mace. There he is up there. There he is. Look at him. There he is. Oh, look at them. They're having a ball. And, and this is what we talk about, these bee-friendly pollinator gardens, because they're all out here enjoying this mid-morning sun. Status, incredibly tough, very water-wise, sends up flower spikes. And guys, if you pick these flower spikes, they last so long in the vase, and you can even dry them. But if I had to take some of this bok choy, remember I, I told you about the carrot. Yeah, plant the carrot. We took this and we planted it in here. I mean, come on. Come on. Isn't that spectacular? Wouldn't that be amazing? Just amazing. So go out and get them. Get the seeds. Plant the plants and plant them in between your flower beds. Another plant that I want to show you is right at the back there. Um, that beautiful little pink, that is a double corn flower and behind it are forget-me-nots. You can actually see how the, how the leaves, the, the little flowers, there it is, the bees on the end there. They're bending over, and it's this in-between where you've got plants coming up um, through succession. Now the forget-me-not seeds, we literally just threw them in the garden bed. We threw them in there because you can see they've popped up all randomly, um, and that's what we call volunteers. Yeah, succession gardening. Uh, so we've got the status that's doing its thing. We planted um, the cornflowers as seedlings and I also sowed some seed in here. So I've got young ones coming through whilst these guys are more mature. So that's where I get that succession that I'm looking for. Okay, in the back, let's move around over here, let's move around and in these petunias um, were some butterflies this morning. Also they love it and the silver, the lightness, that's what they like going to. Um, here's that lavender guys, Here's the lavender that we were talking about earlier. Um, beautiful and happy in the garden. Um, and then of course, let's go across to the echinacea. Now, here it is. This is the echinacea, uh, which you know you sometimes take when, you, when you're feeling a bit fluey. Um, but these are spectacular. Um, butterflies love them, bees love them. And you can see here, they're all over them. There we go. They are loving it. They're just loving it. And in amongst the forget-me-nots. And this is what we call about that succession planting. 
about having something pushing through because now after these echinaceas have gone through, look what's popping up in the back. There's the inca lily, that beautiful pink of the inca lily. Ah, oh, and there the bee sitting on the pink forget-me-not. So as the one starts going over, the next starts pushing through. And that's how we're able to get that beautiful succession. Okay, take a look over here. We spoke about some shrubs that are so important. And this is one that you just have to have in the garden. This is called Salvia Salmia. Now, for those of you who have got our latest issue of The Gardener magazine and Detainee, you would know that we were hit by a hailstorm. Guys, this bed was flattened. This bed was absolutely flattened about four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, probably. And look at it now. And it's because we're composting. We used EcoBuzz as a preventative for the powdery mildew and the downy mildew because of all the damage that was caused. But this garden has exploded after the hail. And Salmia is one of those. This plant was sticks. You saw the images in the magazine. It was just simply sticks. And it's pushed through and looking beautiful. And the sunbirds are what love this plant. And you can see we've got some dotted all around this garden bed. We've got the pale pink in the right hand corner. We've got this lovely maroon over here. And popping out in between it are our forget-me-nots. Okay, now I told you I wanted to show you something really special. Um, and I do this every winter um, and I plant mustard, guys. Look at it. Look how big these leaves are. Beautiful, delicious, yummy red mustard. Now, now this is the mustard yeah, that makes mustard seeds. That's him. I mean, th this, this guy is going to flower eventually. So I love it for a few reasons. Number one, it's this beautiful foliage against the backdrop of this lovely Penicetum cabaret. And against the Salmia, I've got that red coming through. And we leave this plant right until October. Because what happens shortly after this, as soon as the temperatures start warming up, is that it sends up a spark, a flower spark, much like I showed you on the Pak Choi. Sends up a flower spark, the aphids come along, birds come to it, the flowers are there, the bees are there, the butterflies are there. It's a riot, guys. And it happens right here on the edge of my border. Just spectacular. So this, my friends, and these are only three plants, eh? Three little plants popped in here. I've got some more on the other end of the garden. But um, I love it. And of course, the leaves are edible. So when you eat them, yeah, there's the mustard. Ooh, ha ha, na ha ha, there it is. There's the mustard. Don't use too much of it in salads. Oh my word, ha, this is a hot baby. This is a bit of a wasabi kick going on here. Um, so if you are gonna use it in salads, guys, little bits, hey? Just like little, little bits. And if your mother or if your mother in law is coming, whole leaves, baby, whole leaves. Okay, but we're talking about these amazing, amazing, gadgets and the plants that you can use. I want to show you this. We've been fiddling around with this system for the last few weeks in the garden and oh caramba have we had fun. This is called, and I'm going to get in here into the garden bed without breaking any plants. Um, this is called the Gardena Click Up System. Now how nifty is this? So so look here, look here, look here, look here. Um, and you know what? Okay wait, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Okay, so this is obviously for the birds. It's a seed. So this guy comes off over here. You pour the seed in there, okay? And then obviously as the birds eat it, so it then opens up. But if it rains, see? Because that lives on there. If it rains, the seed doesn't get wet. And, and that's what, that's so important. And the fact that you don't need somewhere to hang it. I mean, I've just taken this, this here, the spark, stuck it in the garden bed. You can see there it is. Stuck it in the garden bed, wherever I want it. It's a mobile bird seeder unit. Um, but the best part about it is that I can interchange it out to other things. So all I do is pull this down here. It's a little click system. Pull it down. Out that comes. You see? Just like your little little hose things. All right. And then, ha, look what I can pop on top. Click that in. I've got, <laughs> isn't it, no, no? It's a little bug hotel. Yes. Because when we're getting the pollinators into the garden, we're going to be getting all the other beauties in as well. Bug Hotel, the other click-up system that they've got is a um, rain gauge, which everybody's going to need coming up to summer. And of course, the best of all, it's got a fire torch, a garden torch. 
you know, that you tribe is spoken. Okay, so you can get a couple of those, put them around the garden. Um, beautiful for lum illuminating the garden in the evenings. Um, and yeah, when you're bored of that, you unclick it. Okay, bug hotel, move to one side, put that in, bugs will be okay. And then when you want it, you just simply put it back. And the fact that it's mobile, you can just pick it up and away you go. So uh, yeah, I really have loved playing around with it. And uh, I think well done to Gardena and those very clever people and all the ingenuity. Um, they, they really are quite smart people. But anyway, let's get back to the pollinators. Um, and uh, I'm going to jump back into my space and have a sip of water. Mm. I hope you enjoyed that little garden tour, guys. Um, I, I have to tell you, I, I was completely amazed at, at how the garden recovered um, after the hail. Just, just incredible. And, and, and I'm not bragging here at this point, but, but what I want to say is that I think because the soil is taken care of, because the soil is good, it's mulched, um, it's fed with organic fertilizers. We, we use um, safe products. Um, I, I truly believe that the garden recovered so much quicker because of those things um, that, that were in the garden that were established there. So literally everything got a really good pruning. But after that, man, it just shot through and is looking fantastic. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we could take a little walk out there this morning. Okay, so we've spoken about shrubs, we've spoken about perennials, and now I want to get down to what can you do, how else can we get it, and what are some other ways that we can make sure that we've got that succession, okay, we know what that succession is, that's by the next lot coming through and the next lot, and I want to talk about these here, guys. Um, the guys at Mayford Seeds have got some amazing plants specifically for pollinators. And I'm going to start off with this. Now, um, this is Alison. And the screaming that you hear in the background, guys, um, is, is the neighbors having, having some good fun um, on their quad bike. So here is beautiful Alison. Now, and there's a worldwide shortage of Alison seeds at the moment. And you're going to find it probably quite difficult to find Alison in punnets um, around your garden center. Um, but let me tell you, it is so easy to grow it from seed. So get out there and get it, because this is what it can do in your garden. Look, look at that. This is what lovely Alison, which butterflies adore. They just adore it, and bees are like. And we know that Alison has, oh, it's, it's like I've just opened a jar of honey. No, it really is. This is like my... This is like my creamed honey that I had on my toast this morning. That's here, right in here. So plant this right on the border edging, right on the edge so that you can get to enjoy it. Now, alisum seed is very small, guys. It's very small. So there are two ways that you can sow it. One, you can sow it directly into the garden beds. Take a look here. It's really fine seed. Ooh -hoo, and don't sneeze, whatever you do. Um, it's really fine seed. You can sow this into the garden beds directly. And as it starts germinating, Okay, and this is important, listen up. As it starts germinating, I then want you to select every second or third one, okay? And the, 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 the weaker ones in between, pull them out and move them somewhere else in the garden. Very important because if you've sown them and they come up too thick, you're not going to get good looking Allison plants like this. So sow them, let them germinate. Then you're going to take out every second or third one so that you're left with the strong plants in that area. Sunny position, well drained, um, amazing for the pollinators, um, and that's one option. And next option is this, um, beautiful lobelia. Oh man, can't, can't go without it. This is a little hanging bowl that I planted up, and this is what it's going to look like. That is what your blue lobelia is going to look like. Originally indigenous, our, our little lobelias, um, but this water-wise, bee-friendly, you can throw it and sow it literally right there where you want it to come up, or you can do it into little seedling punnets, um, and away it comes. Nice and easy, beautiful for baskets, 
pots, hanging baskets, and now, oh, imagine, I've got to do this, Mason, I've got to do this. Imagine if we put some, look there, imagine if we put some blue lobelia in this little window box that we made here. Ah, oh, isn't that spectacular? Okay, one of the others that you can use, indigenous, um, which has got larger seed, much easier to handle, um, are the osteospermums. Now, this is what an osteospermum looks like. Indigenous, easy to plant, sun-loving, um, well-drained soil, planted on banks, use it in baskets, use it on borders, um, and it does the job. It's tough, um, water-wise, and of course, pollinator friendly. Okay, beautiful plant, beautiful, beautiful. Remember these open up um, as, the, as the sun starts waking up. So these guys, it'll open up and then in the evenings they close up as well. It, it, it's a spectacular plant. And I love, look inside here, just come right close. Look, look, look right in here. Come right in. I want you to see the pollen. You can actually see the pollen. Look at that, the pollen on the edge here. There it is. There it is. That's what we're gardening for, guys. We're gardening for a bit of pollen on the end of our noses. And that's what we're doing. Um, beautiful osteospermum. Fantastic. And another must-have that is certainly from days of our granny's gardens. Yes, you'll remember these plants are the wonderful zinnias. Now, guys, you just you can't beat this. Um, uh, we have zinnias in the garden. Um, during the summer months, so we'll start sowing them towards any time from now uh, to the end of July, we can start sowing them. If you're in a frost area, then I want you to rather sow them into little punnets. But these zinnias are absolute babe magnets for butterflies and bees. Uh, they just love it. You get the beautiful and tall. They give you some nice height in garden beds, um, and they last right throughout the summer months and even into autumn. We had a pull hours out literally early winter because they were still going on and they also make spectacular dried flowers. But remember guys, if you're still in a cold area, if you're still getting frost, um, it's important, and what have I got attached to me? If you're in a frost area, it's important that you use one of these little guys, which is a little propagator. It's an unheated propagator. Um, you can get these on my online store guys and they make life so much easier. We sowed these seeds yesterday um, and likewise you can sow your zinnias. If you're in a frost area you can sow your osteos and remember look out for these icons on the packets okay because this tells you what they'll do so look out for them. Water wise, indigenous, bee friendly, throw and sow. Okay nice and simple. Uh, remember if you're using a propagator like this okay and you have sown them when you're sowing them, sow them in this, okay? This is your palm peat. This is your winner. This is your ticket to becoming a seed sowing rock star. Here I've sown them directly in some palm peat. I've given them a good water, and I want to show you. Where's my little gadget that I had? Oof. And I found this little gadget the, the other day. It's so cool, guys. It's like a water bottle, but it's for gardens. Ah, 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 mm. Okay, but what it is, look here, it's got this little guy that you attach here. <laughs> it's so nunu. Or it's got this little guy that you attach here. So if you're wanting to water something like up on a, come with me, I'll show you here. Um, if you're wanting to water something that's maybe high up, okay, so let's pretend it's up here. Um, look at that, nice and easy. There you can just give it a water. So, so, so nunu. Um, it's a squeeze bottle as well. Oh, these guys are so clever. They're far too clever. Like, I'm like, why didn't I think about that? Yeah, okay. Anyway, so for sowing seed, um, we've been playing around with this little guy and look at that, just to give it a watering. So it's like it's a little shower. It's a mini shower head. And all you're doing is squeezing it here um, and giving it a good watering. So if you're in a frost area, guys, get your packets of seeds, get your propagator, because remember, when you have watered them, and you pop the lid on your propagator and you close these vents, it creates its own little ecosystem. Look there. Can you see the condensation? So you would not need to water until these seeds germinate. Once these seeds have germinated, then you open the vents 
okay? And then you would need to start watering. How often? You're going to need to water every day. You will see that the, your soil medium, your palm peat, will start changing color as soon as it dries, okay? Especially when you've opened the vents. As soon as you open the vents, obviously, because now that moisture that's in here is going to be going out. Then you would need to water. A couple of days after that, take the lid off, get these new little guys acclimatized to a bit of brighter light. From here, you can prick them out into smaller pots or straight into the garden. Um, we love using these guys, um, the little propagator, because it saves a lot of heartache. Because very often, yep, I also, I, I forget, I forget to water the seeds. You know, it happens. But if they're in this guy, I don't need to worry about it. Because when I've sown them, even if I go back every third day, that's still okay. Because there's enough moisture going in on here. Alrighty, so there we've given you, like, <laughs> there's a 101 very, very quickly on, on your pollinator gardens. The most important thing to remember, guys, is about succession. It's about having the bird bath, having the trees, having the mid shrubs, having those slightly lower, having the perennials, grasses, annuals, that will provide an edible hub for most of these little insects that we are trying to attract to the garden. That's what we want. Be responsible about what you're spraying um, and make sure that we're creating that environment for those plants. Right, guys, um, before we start to uh, do a quick roundup, um, I want you to check out uh, what your jobs are for the weekend because although it might be winter, there's still loads to do in the garden. Um, so sit tight, have your notebook ready and check this out. Right, everyone, so you've got your tasks for the weekend. You know what plants to go out and find at your local garden center. You know what products to use. You know what seeds to look for to make sure that you have got everything you need. And, you know, we're not going to get it right all at once, but that's also okay because that's part of the journey. Guys, remember to get your hands on your latest copy of the Gardener and Detainee magazines. We've got fab articles in here. We showcase a garden in the coldest, most coldest part of South Africa, in Kokstad, where it gets minus degrees. It snows in their backyards, and in summers get up to 45 degrees. It's a beautiful garden, um, full of roses and wonderful spring flowers. We give you a great article on designing with pavers and how to get a better look than just a whole backyard full of big, big, ugly pavers. Um, plus, there's fur kid friendly herbs um, and a great DIY on how you can make your own leaf cement motives for the wall. Fabulous, fabulous. You gotta get it. You gotta get it. Guys, of course, there's everything that you need about what to do in the garden now and getting your garden prepared for the all important spring. Um, a huge shout out and a very big thank you to our friends from Mayford Seeds. Um, guys, love your new packaging. Good job. Love the icons. Um, to Gardena, your click up system rocks, baby. And the tribe has spoken. I love it. Um, and I will be lighting up that, um, that uh, fire torch tonight again in the garden to Eco Buzz Responsible Gardening um, and doing it the right way. Uh, well done to you guys and thank you for the support. Um, from me to you guys, uh, I don't have much else that's left to say except take care of yourselves, um, enjoy the garden. We have time now. We don't even need to make up excuses because we have the time that we can spend it in our beautiful gardens. Um, take care of you and yours. God bless you all. And most importantly, till next time, happy gardening. Gardening with Tanya was proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Mayford. Grow your own bee-friendly flowers. EcoBuzz. Where nature leads the way. Environmentally friendly solutions for your gardens. And TanyaFisser.com. For all your gardening goodies and supplies. 
all plants kindly supplied by Blackwoods, the home of gardening. Calling all green-fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands-on practical advice and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, The Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za.